Welcome to On Topic, a series of conversations with experts on issues of importance to Alaska. I'm Jim Johnson, president of the University of Alaska, and I'll be talking with distinguished scholars and practitioners. In this segment, we explore the topic of free speech on college campuses, and my guest is Erwin Chemerinsky, the Dean of the Law School at the University of California, Berkeley. I want to welcome you, um, Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of the Berkeley Law School, to our very first on-topic conversation uh, here at the University of Alaska, sponsored by the University of Alaska Press. Uh, the whole idea here is to bring in national and global experts on issues of the day. Uh, issues that are of concern to people, issues that are important uh, to people, not only here in Alaska, but, but nationally. And, you know, our role here at the University of Alaska is not just to do research and not just to teach and not just to do public outreach. Those are critical, no question about it. Uh, but we also have a very powerful role in convening uh, and in hosting conversations on important topics. And so this, as I mentioned, is our inaugural uh, on-topic uh, conversation, and I couldn't be more honored uh, than to have you uh, join us. It's uh, my great honor. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, well, you're very welcome. I uh, first saw you at a meeting of university presidents in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, and the room was jam-packed, and I wondered why would this room be jam-packed? And so I went uh, to the meeting, and uh, standing room only, and I was simply amazed at the encyclopedic knowledge of the court and of the Constitution and of the First Amendment uh, and of the issues around speech on campus. Uh, and of course, uh, you're you know, talking about your book, your recent book, which is a, a wonderful uh, read. You inspired me to go back and reread John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, uh, which I did this summer while riding my bicycle <laughs> around Fairbanks. Um, but it was a stunning presentation, and uh, the clarity with which you spoke, uh, the punctuation perfect, no notes, sense of humor and command of interesting detail uh, was was really impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And then on my return, I, I bumped in, Alaska is a small town, a, a big state and a small town. And I bumped into one of my friends who's one of the members of the state Supreme Court. And I mentioned uh, that I had been to this presentation. He said, oh, yes, of course, Erwin. Uh, we bring him up to Alaska every year for the Bar Association. And I thought, wow, uh, I'm going to go to the Bar Association meeting this year. So uh, so I attended. And of course, uh, my friend's lawyers were, what are you doing here? And I, well, the rock star is here. I'm, I'm going to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so in any case, um, I'm, I'm re I've been really looking forward to the conversation. You. You're very kind to come up to me there and invite me to come speak at the well, University of Alaska. Well, I'm so thrilled that it worked out for me to do so. Thank you. Thank you. So I was back east at a couple of big universities uh, last week, and I had the occasion to visit with my graduate school professor, my main teacher, and I thanked her in that, that meeting for teaching me a couple of things. One is to be able to summarize very quickly academic arguments and books and articles and that sort of thing. And the other thing was to teach me that passion was really important. And that if you didn't have passion for an academic subject or pursuit, you wouldn't be able to do the hard work that it takes to get it done. And number two, it would probably be boring. Uh, so I thought I would ask you, given your tremendous career, hundreds of articles, 10 books, uh, regarded as the top legal educator in the country, uh, you know, the accolades are, are long and, and well deserved. Where does your passion for this come from? I think from two things. One is it's a passion for civil rights. Mm -hmm. I decided I went to go to law school because I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Mm -hmm. If you had talked to me at any point when I was in college, I would have told you I wanted to be a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I took all the classes at Northwestern to become a certified high school teacher. I did my student teaching at Highland Park High School. Mm -hmm. I became a certified high school teacher. But then I decided I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Mm -hmm. I said law is the most powerful tool for social change. And I wanted to be like them and do what they did, and so mm -hmm. decided to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And that's not changed in the more than 40 years since. Mm -hmm. I still have that passion for how can we use the law to make society better. And civil rights, of course, includes free speech. Mm -hmm. But the other passion comes from education, mm -hmm. that I love being a teacher. 
and love teaching at all levels. I mm -hmm. teach primarily at the law school level, but I've taught college students for most of the last 30 years. I teach in high schools whenever I can get the opportunity mm -hmm. to go lecture there. And so I think by focusing on free speech on campus, I'm really combining two things about which I'm passionate. Mm -hmm. Civil rights, which includes the First Amendment, and education. Mm -hmm. What worries you today as a, as a scholar at the nexus between these very important parts of our society, the law and education? Are there, are there things that worry you? My greatest fear is the lack of civic education in the United States mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. And I think it touches this topic because so much beyond this. I worry that people don't have an understanding of courts and how judges are different from other government officials mm -hmm. and different from politicians. Mm -hmm. I worry in terms of free speech, a lack of understanding of the history with regard to expression and why we've gotten to this point in time. Mm -hmm. I've so often had interaction with undergraduates and law students who don't realize how much the advancement of civil rights in American history is a result of freedom of speech. Right. No, it's very interesting. You know, I uh, used to teach political science, and uh, Aristotle was one of my subjects. And in his politics, he uh, describes various types of regimes uh, that were existent then and, and prior, and then what they devolved into. And uh, I didn't go back and verify it before this uh, this talk, but democracies devolve, according to Aristotle, into demagogueries. Uh, is that something that uh, you see as well in your study of the court and of freedom of speech? No form of government lasts forever. Mm -hmm. Democracies are there until they're not. We can look at many countries around the world that have been democracies, mm -hmm. but aren't democracies anymore. Mm -hmm. So we really have to fear in any democracy that there may be a point at which it will cease existing. Mm -hmm. The lesson, of course, of this is we can't take for granted our democracy, and we have to be worried, I think especially at this moment in time, it's our democracy going to devolve into demagoguery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can all agree that there are signs uh, of that for sure. Are there things that, uh, in addition to the work you're doing, the writing you're doing, uh, are there some... Uh, bright lights. Uh, are there some positive developments in, in your view, uh, perhaps in universities, perhaps in civil society more broadly, uh, perhaps on the court, uh, that, that give you some confidence, if not hope, uh, in our ability to, uh, to strengthen uh, our democracy? I think the commitment to free speech is more deeply embedded in our society and more widely accepted than ever before. You look through much of American history and the way in which speech was suppressed and punished. Mm -hmm. You don't have to look to ancient history. Right. You think of the McCarthy era, mm -hmm. where people lost their jobs, including in universities, right. and sometimes their liberty, just for being suspected of being communists. Mm -hmm. I think that universities have learned from that experience, and there's much more robust protection for academic freedom mm -hmm. in speech than certainly there was a half century ago. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by the fact that the commitment to free speech tends not to be ideologically divided mm -hmm. in the same way that so much right now is ideologically right, divided. Right. Both conservatives and liberals share a commitment to free speech, mm -hmm. but there might be difference on particular issues. I'm encouraged as I look at campuses across the country about how robust free speech is on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Walk across the Berkeley campus on any day and you go to Sproul Plaza and there's tables set up with students getting petitions, and there's people holding signs, and there might be a demonstration. And I'm fortunate enough to get to speak over the course of a year on a number of campuses, mm -hmm. and I see that over and again. Mm -hmm. On September 17th, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions held a conference in Washington where he proclaimed there's a crisis of free speech on campus in the United States. The same day, Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, spoke at the National Constitution Center about a crisis of free speech. I don't see it. There's certainly high profile incidents. Mm -hmm. There are times where I disagree with what particular university administrators might be doing. But I think free speech is alive, well, and robust in the United States on campus across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I happen to also, amidst my meetings back east, uh, attend the inauguration of the new president at, at Harvard. 
and there was robust uh, speech uh, being exhibited there. Uh, you know, even as we were, as Harvard was celebrating this this great uh, day and the inauguration of a of a new leader. And that's the way it should be. Right. And of course, when it happens without incident, no one pays any attention. Mm -hmm. It's the occasional incident that has unfortunate events or where campus decides to stop it, that right. gets national attention. Right. But it's, as we know, always dangerous to generalize from a few examples and say that they're representative of the whole, mm -hmm. and it's not here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, an area that's fascinating to me, and I, in fact, I was just speaking with a, a friend recently about hate speech. And uh, and he said, I really oppose that. Uh, and, and I think he actually thought that it was illegal and, uh, and unconstitutional, that it was not protected. And I said, no, actually, I think it is protected. Now, it can cross over some lines, no question about that. But I wonder if you could uh, talk about that just a little bit. If sure. you, uh, and that is, what, what really is it? And then what are some of those uh, well, I guess one question would be, why is it protected? Why is it core to our democracy? Uh, one of the things I shared with my friend was that if it were civil, it wouldn't need to be protected. Um, but if you could share some of your sure. thoughts about hate speech, because I think it's it's very subjective uh, concept in many respects, but the court has dealt with it and put some, put some sideboards on it. I so often been asked, where is the line between free speech mm -hmm. and hate speech? And I have to say that's a false distinction. Right. Hate speech is protected under the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. There was a Supreme Court case that involved a St. Paul ordinance that prohibited burning a, a cross or painting a swastika in a manner likely to anger, alarm, or cause resentment. It's obviously prohibiting hate speech. Mm -hmm. Nine to nothing, the Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. The United States is different from European countries. Mm -hmm. Every European country has a law that prohibits hate speech. So I think your question is an important one. Why in the United right. States is it different? Some of it, I think, is how difficult, if not impossible, it is to write a speech code or a law that defines hate speech in a manner that's not unduly vague and overbroad. Mm -hmm. In the United States, any law that regulates speech has to be clear about what's prohibited and what's allowed. No one's found a way to do that for hate speech. Mm -hmm. In the early 1990s, over 360 college universities adopted hate speech codes. Most copied as the definition of hate speech things from the European law. Mm -hmm. One of the more famous these was the University of Michigan. It prohibited speech that stigmatized or demeaned on the basis of race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. But what does it mean to stigmatize or demean? Mm -hmm. A sociobiology graduate student brought a challenge and said, I want to research about whether there's inherent difference in behavior between men and women. Might I be found to be stigmatized or demeaning on the basis of sex? And the court struck down the Michigan hate speech code. Mm -hmm. I think some of it is that experience has to show us that we have to be cautious about embracing laws like this. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, they're used against the very groups that are meant to be protected. Mm -hmm. From the time the University of Michigan adopted its hate speech code until it was struck down by the federal district court, every enforcement action under it was brought against African American and Latino students. Mm -hmm. You see the same thing in Europe. Mm -hmm. But maybe most of all, in the answer to your question, hate speech is protected because it expresses an idea. It's a vile idea, but under the First Amendment, all ideas are protected. Mm -hmm. Just as John Marshall Harlan said, to censor words is to censor ideas. Mm -hmm. So we can't cleanse the English language to please the most squeamish among mm -hmm. us. And maybe the bottom line is what you said. We don't need freedom of speech to protect the speech we like. We'd let that go on anyway. We really need freedom of speech to protect the speech we detest, because the only way your speech or my speech will be safe tomorrow is to protect the speech we don't like today. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about the the only speech uh, that we listen to often is the speech we like, and I think there's a lot of discussion uh, in the media today and in society generally about these echo chambers, and it goes back, of course, to deep psychological. Uh, tendencies of humans, uh, the concept of confirmation bias. That is, we only allow in that with, with which we we agree, but I think it's been exacerbated. Uh, what are your some of your thoughts about how universities, uh, how other uh, organizations might bridge uh, that, I think, really yawning 
uh, gap that is a, a real challenge to our democracy. I have a theory that I'm starting to work on that the development of national media in the 20th century had a tremendously unifying effect on society. We were always a polarized society, mm -hmm. North versus South, and we dealt with all of the other divisions. But when movies began, all of a sudden there was a national media that we were all seeing, and then mm -hmm. it became radio, and everyone was listening to the same radio mm -hmm. programs. And then television came, and there were three networks when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. and we all watched the same programs, mm -hmm. and everyone was getting news from one of those places, like Walter Cronkite sure. or Huntley Brinkley. That's dramatically changed now. Mm -hmm. The proliferation of media has many benefits, but it makes it very easy that if you're conservative, you can read and watch this. If you're liberal, you can read and watch this. And I believe that this has tremendously contributed to the polarization that we see in our society mm -hmm. today. So then I get to your question, what can universities do? I think universities can model civil discourse, and universities can provide a basis for exposing students to a variety of different ideas. Mm -hmm. That I want on my campus and in my law school to have a series of debates on controversial issues. So long as the speakers can disagree without being disagreeable, right. they right. can model how people can handle controversial issues. Mm -hmm. And in that way also, by bringing in a wide array of speakers of different views, I can expose my students to things they may not otherwise do. And I think one of the great things about where I teach is literally every day at Berkeley Law, there's three or four different speakers. Mm -hmm. There's symposium and contras every week. And then you go onto the larger campus where right. that's exponentially so. And that's what I think a campus and a university can and should do. Mm -hmm. How do you, and you address this to some extent in the, the book, this dilemma between on one hand, and it may be a false one, I don't know, but uh, the dilemma on the one hand of, of fostering the intellectual diversity that you're talking about, which I think is core uh, to the mission of our universities, uh, and at the same time, a, a safe and respectful place for learning. And, uh, and, and we we try to navigate our way through that. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on, it's probably a false dilemma, I hope it is, uh, but what are some of your thoughts about uh, managing that dilemma that many universities face today? I think it is a dilemma, and there are times when there are tensions. I think that generally campuses need to find ways to create that inclusive learning environment that doesn't involve suppressing free speech. Mm -hmm. And there are many things that campuses can do in that regard. But there are times when I think campus officials need to speak out and condemn a hateful expression. Mm -hmm. They can't stop it. They shouldn't punish it. But they can condemn it. We had an incident at Berkeley Law School last fall where Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz was going mm -hmm. to speak. And he's controversial. He's a staunch supporter of President Trump. He's an ardent supporter of the current policies of the Israeli government. And there were protests, but it was all peaceful. But then someone drew a swastika over his picture there's a poster on a law school bulletin board. I learned of it at 4 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. At 8 a.m. on Thursday morning, I sent a message to the entire community mm -hmm. condemning the hate speech and explaining why it's inconsistent with the community we are and that we aspire to be. Right. I don't deny that seeing the swastika caused great emotional pain to people, and no message from me is going to lessen that. Right. But it is an important occasion for saying, this is who we are. I think counter-speech and counter-demonstrations mm -hmm. are important. Mm -hmm. When the white supremacist Richard Spencer was speaking at Auburn University, there was organized a counter-demonstration in the large Texas A&M football stadium. Mm -hmm. And the thousands of faculty, staff, students came together. And I talked to people who were there about how unifying that event was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's about having cyberbullying policies. Sometimes about providing protection for students, mm -hmm. uh, places for students to come together who are feeling victimized. I argued a case in the Federal Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia in May, it's still awaiting decision, a case called Feminist Majority Foundation versus Mary Washington University. Mary Washington University is a public university in Virginia, and they were considering, uh, as a campus matter, whether to allow Greek life, fraternities and sorority. Mm -hmm. And some women spoke up against it, saying whenever there's fraternities, there's more violence against women. These women then get targeted in a very ugly way. Mm -hmm. Over 700 harassing messages were sent over the social media platform that then existed, Yik Yak. Mm -hmm. Many threatened with rape and murder. Many were misogynistic. Mm -hmm. They were just 
ugly. Mm-hmm. The women went to the campus, and the campus posted on its website saying that this was anonymous speech over social media. The campus couldn't do anything. I don't think that's right. Hmm. Um, I, put aside whether the campus should have found out who was making threats and punished that, there were so many things that the campus could have done, and I think had the duty to do with regard to Title IX and preventing right. sexual harassment and mm-hmm. sex discrimination. Mm-hmm. So it's not easy. And I, I don't minimize that the harms that can come from hateful speech, right. but I think that there's still a lot of things that campuses can and should do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the, uh, with confidence, I can say my favorite class as an undergraduate was constitutional law. Uh, and one of the things I learned there was to see American society and see American history through the lens of the court. Uh, and the court's decisions. And one thing we learned there is how certain issues are resolved by the court. But another thing that was fascinating is how many issues are not resolved by the court, or at least not resolved in a timely way, such that other things happen, like the Civil War, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you see any big unresolved issues, uh, unresolved issues in American society uh, that have been in not really either taken up wholly by the court or, or taken care of, if you will, uh, by the court that we ought to keep our eyes on as we, we look to the court going forward. I think the most important things may involve our political process. Mm-hmm. We say we're a democracy, and yet we choose our president through an electoral college Hmm. that twice in 16 years led to somebody who lost the popular vote being chosen as president. Mm -hmm. Whether you like or dislike the person who was chosen, Mm -hmm. there's got to be something disconcerting about a democracy where the loser becomes president. Mm -hmm. We're the only country in the world where that's possible. Mm -hmm. I think partisan gerrymandering has created an enormous threat to democracy. This, of course, is with the political party that controls the legislature, draws election districts to maximize seats for the party. Mm -hmm. It's not new, it goes back to the earliest days of American history, but computer programs become so sophisticated, it's possible for partisan journey to go on with much more precision than ever Mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. We all learned it's supposed to be voters who choose their elected officials. Partisan journey means that the elected officials are choosing their voters. Mm -hmm. I worry about what money in politics mean for the democratic process. Mm -hmm. I think Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, which said corporations can spend as much as they want Mm -hmm. to get candidates elected, defeated, is going to regard as one of the worst Supreme Court cases in American history. Mm -hmm. We look back in hindsight and went, So my concerns really go back to your question earlier about democracy. Um, I worry about these as a threat to democracy. So what is, um, now that you've done this work, and of course you're touring the country. Um, Not very much touring the country. Yeah, but, well, well, we appreciate that you've come here. Uh, thrilled to be here. Us. And you know, you're teaching work, the, you, you argue cases before courts. I do, I argued on Tuesday this week. Wow, okay. Uh, in the Ninth Circuit. Okay. What's next uh, on your mind? Uh, because I know a, a mind like yours uh, Thank you. is, is you're always, uh, Thinking Thank ahead, you. and what are some you. things you can share sure. with well, us very kind to ask. that's on, on your screen for um, the future? Like you, my fi- primary professional obligation is administration. I'm the mm-hmm. dean of a large and complex yes. law school. Mm-hmm. I'm just beginning my second year in that role, and I hope I'll do it for many years to come. Mm-hmm. And I've discovered that's a more than full time job. Um, in terms of writing, I have a new book coming out in November. We the People, a progressive reading of the Constitution for the 21st century. It's a book that I wrote, frankly, after President Trump was elected, Mm -hmm. and we're seeing a conservative court for a long time to come, Mm -hmm. and saying, what's an alternative vision of the one we're likely to see from the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. And I'm excited for the publication of that book. As you know, one of the great feelings is when all the page proofs are done and everything is finished, and just waiting for it to come out and to hold it. I now want to write a book about after Trump. And I'm not exactly sure what form it will take. Maybe mm-hmm. just focusing on the federal judiciary, maybe more generally rebuilding government. But I think that the Trump presidency has been unlike any in American history, and we need to think about what comes next. Mm-hmm. But I'm at the earliest stages of thinking mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. 
You know, I, um, some of the um, faculty I met with when I was back east last week, uh, one is the editor of the program on Negotiations Journal at Harvard, the Negotiation Journal. And the next edition will be about the effects of the current administration on how we resolve conflict, uh, not simply in our institutions of uh, our legislatures, our courts, uh, but also how we resolve issues in labor management relations, for example, or in commercial contexts and, and other, uh, other areas. So I think there are uh, quite a few fellow, uh, fellow travelers, I think, uh, right. I think, across the country looking at these issues uh, and uh, hopefully seeing uh, that, there, that there may be some positive attributes of, of something on the other side as well. You know, when you talk about disagreeing in, in an agreeable way, I think some of the time that requires us to really listen to that other side. And is there a little gem there that we hadn't really thought about? And how do we capture that? Uh, and, and maybe that's a way we can come together. I think that's right. And I wish we could talk about this without it seeming partisan. Mm -hmm. I wish I could criticize President Trump's nastiness and rhetoric without it seeming political, mm -hmm. because I wouldn't want a Democrat to be as insulting and as nasty mm -hmm. as President Trump is. And yet, I don't know that I can say that without it coming off as partisan and political. I don't mean yeah. it to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all about how we choose to talk to one another. Yeah, and uh, and listen. I think that's uh, I an, uh, an art, perhaps, but really a, a practice. Uh, it's all about projection and transmission and less and less, unfortunately, about uh, a calm and humble, perhaps, uh, but often that's the courageous path, uh, listening and, and learning from each other. I very much agree. Yeah. Well, Dean Chemerinsky, uh, thank you. It's been a real honor and a pleasure uh, for me to have this conversation with you. Thank you uh, so much for sharing your insights, uh, brief though it is, because you know so much, we could spend um, hours and hours, I'm sure, uh, talking about these, uh, these interesting uh, issues. I, uh, for more on this important topic uh, for universities, and I think really for our democracy, uh, I would commend Dean Chemerinsky's book, Free Speech on Campus, uh, uh, co-written with Howard Gilman, and uh, uh, published in, in 2017. So a very, very timely uh, work. So. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Truly my honor and pleasure to do this.